Waters and this seminar about European migration policy. My name is Tobi Dimandon and I am working as a senior fellow at Forest. And I'm very happy today to introduce uh, this uh, extremely curious panel we have gathered today. And uh, first we have Philippe Dugret, who is, uh, among, among other things, the author of this book which has been published in many languages, Immigrants, Your Country Needs Them. And uh, Philippe is currently working as a special advisor to President Barroso, leading his time. And uh, we have also our Minister of Migrants, Tobias Bidstrom, uh, and also the spokesperson of the European Family of Family. They're very welcome. Uh, we're going to do like a talk. discussions during this week, outside and inside. Um, we're going to look at European migration policy. I mean, uh, when it comes to Sweden, we have all, during the last 24 hours, been very you know, focused on Swedish integration and immigration issues due to the fact that yesterday it was Sweden that was in the year so I'd say that the, the questions are rather high in our Awareness. And um, we're going to speak about today what's happening on the European level. That is a rather new debate. I mean, for 25 years maybe that has been a common European debate, but it's not older than that. And I've asked, I've asked Philippe to start by giving us an introduction, maybe an overview of what's happening in the European area, perhaps maybe with some special insights from the case in, in Great Britain. And uh, after that, I've asked Tobias and Maria to give their comments also related to the Swedish uh, situation and position in the European countries. So I give the floor to you. Very welcome. Thank you, Tobi. Um, it's great uh, to be here on this beautiful island, uh, this wonderful event, and I apologize uh, for not being able to speak uh, in Swedish. Um, I think we're in a very dangerous moment uh, in the debate about immigration uh, in Europe. Because while circumstances differ from country to country, um, uh, populist parties are increasingly successful uh, in many countries. You see Marine Le Pen uh, in France. You see Gerd Wilders uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, you see the UK Independence Party uh, in my own country, Britain. The True Finns uh, in Finland. Golden Dawn in Greece. Jobbik uh, in Hungary. And, of course, the Sweden Democrats here. And opposition uh, to immigration, or should I say, uh, hatred of immigrants, uh, is one of their defining features. And what's even worse is that the populists are increasingly influencing both the tone and the substance uh, of mainstream uh, debate about immigration. So a few years ago, you saw the British Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, calling for British jobs for British workers, which was a slogan for the National Front in the 1970s. Or you saw more recently, uh, during the second round of France's presidential election, Nicolas Sarkozy shamelessly aping um, at the language uh, and some of the messages uh, of the Front National. And in Germany, you see uh, Thilo Sarrazin, uh, a social democrat, former uh, member of the Bundesbank board, uh, who has said outrageous things in his book, Germany uh, is Abolishing Itself. But the biggest worry is that populists are also influencing government policies. We saw that initially with Jörg Haider, who became part of, uh, was supporting the uh, Austrian uh, coalition government a, a decade ago. Then you just have to look in Denmark at the effect that the Danish People's Party had through the support that it provided to the previous government. The drastic tightening uh, of uh, Denmark's uh, immigration laws. And as a result, we have this absurd situation where a Danish man can take in uh, to his country uh, an Afghan puppy, a Burmese kitten, uh, but not a young Chinese bride. And for me, this is like Romeo and Juliet, set against the backdrop of 21st century uh, democracy. Um, and what is the result of this? Are the Danish People's Party satisfied with what they've achieved? No. Now they are demanding a complete stop to immigration from all non-Western countries. And then, of course, more recently, we have again the example of the Netherlands, where the government was relying on the support of Gerd Wilders. So I think there is an important lesson here uh, for Sweden 
and for other countries, which is that mainstream politicians who seek uh, the support of anti-immigrant populists, whether through their words, through their actions, or through formal agreements, are selling their souls to the devil. And this forced impact has a terrible price because it legitimizes extreme anti-immigrant views and it emboldens polit populist politicians to demand even tighter controls. And one of the problems uh, that this populism reflects is that the immigration debate is all too often dominated uh, by emotions instead of rational arguments. Study after study shows that many of the criticisms made of immigration are simply false or vastly exaggerated. And yet still, the old myths uh, survive. When immigrants are working, they're taking our jobs. When they're not working, they're scrounging off the state. When they're poor, they're driving standards down. When they're rich, they're driving prices up. They can't win. They're damned if they do, and damned if they don't. And shamelessly, you see that this irrational prejudice influences debate and policy. In my own country, just last week, uh, Ed Miliband, the, the leader of the Labour Party, himself the son and the grandson of immigrants who arrived in, in Britain illegally, fleeing the Nazis, apologised for the fact that the previous Labour government of which he was part had been too open to immigration. And he justified this shameful apology, not on the basis that he was pandering to prejudice, which is what he was doing, but no, he said that immigrants were driving down wages for low-skilled workers and depriving local people of jobs, even though there is no evidence of that at all. And then we see the Conservatives, who are now in government, and they're trying to implement their populist pledge to limit net migration uh, to less than 100,000 people a year. But because they can't control the number of people coming into the country, and they can't control the number of people are leaving, net migration has actually risen, not fallen. So now they're taking really desperate measures to keep uh, people out. First, clamping down on the small number of high-skilled people. Then they went after international students who bring in huge amounts of revenues to UK universities. And now they're planning Danish-style restriction on foreign marriages. So if you're a British person and you earn less than the equivalent of 200,000 krona a year, you will not be able to bring into Britain your foreign spouse. It's disgusting. Now, as Britain's immigration cap highlights, European immigration policies are often based on a distorted picture of the reality of immigration in the 21st century. A misunderstanding of the true costs and benefits, and a deeply flawed concept of bureaucratic controls. They assume that immigration is mostly a one-way movement of permanent settlement from south to north and from east to west. They assume that newcomers are often a dra drain on society or even a threat to it. But the that the foreigners who will make a positive contribution can be easily identified and that the benefit they bring is limited to the vacancy, the job vacancy that they fill. And therefore, the object of policy is to limit how many people can come in and to try to select certain people on the basis of arbitrary rules and arbitrary categories. Yet each of these assumptions is incorrect. Yes, of course, some people do move and settle permanently, and they're important. But most people flows nowadays are temporary. <coughs> If you look at OECD statistics, they say that more than half of people who've entered a European country have left again, as migrants, have left again within five years, and after ten years, it's three quarters. And when people can move freely, as American bankers can, as European business people can, as everyone as a European citizen can within the European Union, mobility is even greater. So people like me, for example, I work in Brussels during the week, I go home uh, to London uh, in, on weekends, and I have no intention whatsoever of settling uh, in Belgium. But it's not just professionals like me who are increasingly mobile. It's Polish plumbers who spend half the year working in Britain and the other half uh, back uh, in Poland. It's Moroccan farmhands uh, who go pick the crop in Spain. And the biggest category, of course, is international students whose numbers have doubled uh, in the past decade and whose numbers are going to increase even more as more and more Chinese people and Indian people go and get a degree abroad. And the benefits of this new ability, which is 
a whole new world of opportunity for people. A wider and more flexible pool of talent for companies. New ideas, new businesses, both created and spread within the economy and across global migrant networks. And a rich feast of cultural mixing. All those benefits greatly outweigh the costs. So the object, the aim of immigration policy ought to be to be as open and as welcoming as possible, to be flexible and adaptable to the changing needs in labour markets, to compete for people who increasingly have a choice about where <coughs> to move, to try to retain the people that you need, to try to nurture contacts with the networks of people um, who only stay in a country uh, for a while, and to try to make them the most of the diverse skills, not just of newcomers, but of everyone in society. Europe needs to wake up. A new world is dawning where countries like Canada, Australia uh, and New Zealand are competing for the people who used to come uh, automatically to the United States uh, or Europe. Where fast-growing emerging economies like China, India and Brazil are not just a source of workers of all skill levels, but also increasingly a destination of choice. And you can see, for example, the number of Westerners working in Shanghai has multiplied by 13 in 13 years. And where Europe's needs for people are only going to grow as the population ages and the native workforce declines. People to care for the elderly. People to provide medical care. People to do the jobs that not enough local people can do or want to do. People whose talents complement those of local people. People whose knowledge of two cultures uh, can help build trade and investment links with the new emerging powers. Diverse people who can spark off each other creatively. If Europe doesn't wake up, we will be left behind. Thank you. from this seminar, and now I will leave it over to Tobias, who will share uh, some thoughts of what Philippe had said will have for impact to Sweden's state, and uh, you have also been a reformer, you have been, uh, uh, you could say, maybe an exception, a European exception, driving a reform about opening Swedish borders in a time where everyone else seems to close them, so please. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much also for the invitation to come here and speak to you uh, today. Uh, of course, this is a very distinguished assembly. I noticed uh, some ambassadors present in the room, and I noticed also other people, which I think is of considerable interest in the Swedish migratory debate. Uh, and so I, I welcome you very much for, for this. Um, I would also like to add that, well, we have seen some very interesting uh, development in the Swedish migratory debate over the last two years, with the uh, working parliamentary majority, which was constituted through the framework agreement, uh, which was uh, uh, closed uh, as a deal between the Green Party uh, and the uh, alliance of the four centre parties who are present in Sweden. This working parliamentary majority is, of course, a unique one unique not only within the European Union, it is the only example of a situation where a centre-right government has done a deal with the Green Party, but also on a global scale. But it wasn't brought forward, and I would like to underline this as a, you know, a, 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 a win. This was the result of a long-standing cooperation which began in 2008, when, uh, as Ms. David all pointed to, the agreement on the labour migration reform was uh, concluded between our parties. Uh, it uh, continued in 2009 with the appointment of the Parliamentary Committee on Circular Migration, which was headed by the then group leader in, in Parliament, Ms. Michaela Bartoson, uh, and who delivered its final statement one year later in the spring of 2010. And this framework agreement has now enhanced and enlarged this cooperation. It means that we have now a balanced approach uh, to a very, very complex subject. And I would also like to say that, for my part as Minister of Migration, I view the Swedish 
the migration policy as resting on two legs, you might say. It's the asylum policy, which is a right-based uh, um, legislative framework, uh, and you have the labor migration, which is an option. You might call it an option extra. You can actually, through labor migration, decide how many migrants that you want to accept to your country. You can do it in various ways. Uh, asylum is something different. That's a right-based legislation. And this means that you actually have a choice. And we did a choice in 2000, saying that we wanted an open, an as open system as possible. Um, labor migration then, uh, in Sweden, uh, is done through a very simple system, which means that we give the opportunity for every employer who wishes to bring in an employee to Sweden from a third country abroad to do so, provided that you can show to the authorities that you are ready to pay the same salary and offer the same social insurance conditions as are given to our own population already residing in Sweden. There are no quotas, no point systems, and interestingly enough, and I don't think that you can repeat this or retaliate this uh, too many times, the findings of the OECD, which delivered a report on the Swedish migration system in December last year, shows that the Swedish system is the most open, you might say most liberal one, in the entire OECD family. But no other who has such an open system as we have. And it's very uh, cost efficient, very inexpensive for those who use it. But interestingly enough, since 2008, Sweden has only gotten about 50,000 people. We have only written out about 50,000 uh, uh, residence permits. And I think that this should bring some balance, perhaps, some food for thought in the debate. But in spite of the fact that we have such an open system, we still don't have very many people who wish to choose Sweden as the first country of destination. And this brings us back to what Philippe uh, so eloquently uh, observed. Uh, namely, that we are in a race, a race where, where many countries in the world compete. Countries who are having, uh, who are belonging to much larger language groups than what we do, English most notably, Australia, Canada, and the US are all part of this family, to be joined by English, of course, <coughs> and other countries where English uh, uh, matters uh, a lot in the, on the labor market, and so on and so forth. And I think that we should bring this into our mind. Sometimes the fears that if you have a very open system you will be flooded by migrants are simply not true. People are quite conservative. And not many people who wishes to migrate. And a lot of people migrate out of necessity rather than out of choice, which is also something that we should do. So, uh, I totally agree. Uh, we will later on come back to the more broad political situation in the European Union. I think that Philip did an excellent job in giving us this view, so I won't repeat it. But leave the floor to, uh, to Ms. Maria Thamesday. Thank you very much. Thanks, Maria. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Uh, I think it's important to have these talks about the benefits of migration. Uh, however, we should be cautious not to make the benefits our main argument. In fact, arguments for migration are of secondary importance in general. By taking that approach, we automatically join the discussion on whether or not we should have migration. By talking about the benefits or not benefits, we should be aware that we're also giving room to for those who wish to talk about the costs. What I'm saying is we cannot choose migration or no migration. Nations are not primordial, mobility and migration is. It is impossible to stop migration, and even though many attempts are made to, for instance, to stop people from entering Europe, they are not successful. This is the deeper understanding we need to share about migration. From that, we can then move on to ask ourselves how we're going to make the best of the reality that is migration. By, ask, by asking how instead of why, we leave the anti-migration anti actors without answers. When we focus on how we can facilitate mobility and become more open and humane, these actors become irrelevant. Sweden is a good example of this. When the Sweden Democrats gained 5.7% and 
uh, in the election in 2010 uh, and thus entering the parliament. We did not want them to influence uh, Sweden's migration policy, either directly or indirectly, by uh, infecting or influencing the debate and uh, sparking uh, a xenophobic debate by being present in parliament. This was the background to the cooperation now formed between the Green Party and the government on migration issues. We did not want to see the same development in Sweden as we have seen in other European countries, where xenophobic parties have, have influenced the debate as well as the policies. If a xenophobic or right-wing extremist party influenced the, the debate and make it more inhumane and hateful towards immigrants, it is likely to influence the polit policies of the established parties, making them adapt to the extremists. And as the policies of the established parties becoming increasingly stricter, then the extremists can go even further uh, and uh, propose uh, even more extreme proposals. It becomes a vicious circle or a snowball effect, uh, snowball effect and uh, it affects the entire society and the entire debate. The most effective way to stand up against xenophobia and racism is to meet xenophobia with it, what it cannot stand. And that is to meet it with more democracy, more openness, more solidarity. And I'm proud to say that there is a close consensus amongst commentators in Sweden that this is what has happened uh, after the agreement with the, the government and the Green Party. The Sweden Democrats has been, have been marginalized from influencing policy and uh, even the debate has taken a turn towards a more liberal or green tone. Uh, I think uh, the uh, reform that we presented a few days ago is a good example of that. We uh, presented a reform that, uh, will, uh, that uh, undocumented migrants will receive health care. Um, and uh, subsidized healthcare, and I don't think uh, anyone even cared to ask what the Sweden Democrats uh, wanted to say about it. Uh, they were they were completely marginalized, and were, it, that it wasn't really an issue. Uh, and this exper uh, experience makes Sweden important as hopefully a role model uh, for the rest of the EU. We can show how the fear of the so-called migratory pressure is rarely more than a mind ghost. Sweden must also take a more active role in negotiations in Brussels to ensure positive developments on the EU level. Uh, I and uh, the Green MEPs are concerned when we see that all the efforts and initiatives <coughs> aiming at preventing people from reaching the EU. Euroso uh, and uh, smart borders are two examples of uh, very strict and uh, uh, attempts on trying to prevent people from coming here. And when it comes to keeping people out, money never seems to be a problem for the EU member states. At the same time, uh, the Green Party and the government note uh, that many EU countries are not treating asylum seekers in an acceptable manner. There is a problem of arbitrary detention and insufficient judicial support in the asylum process. And there Sweden must act rapidly and forcefully to change these tendencies. about what you were talking about, when the general opinion or when some parties uh, gain uh, supporting opinion, which in their case will have impact on the other parties, what happened in Britain? Why, why did you say, well, was it, I mean, one party is of course that we see financial turmoil and people see lack of resources and then maybe get more easily um, attempted to listen to, to simple solutions, but what would you say, Where does, when does it happen, why does it happen? Well, I think obviously populism is driven by um, a whole different range of things. Um, the word itself suggests that basically it's 
the establishment, the elites are listening to the people. Um, more specifically, um, I think you can look at it in terms of a debate about whether you want an open society or a closed society, and that's what links together globalization, migration, the, the European Union, um, and, and so on. Um, uh, in some cases, the supporters are you know, die-hard racists. In other cases, they are people who um, feel they aren't listened to, it, and it's a protest vote. And in other cases, there are a whole, whole other range of, of motives. Um, I think the important thing in addressing um, populist parties um, uh, is the response of mainstream parties. Uh, now, in some cases, populist parties have got so big that you know, they might be the largest party, for example, we might have that in the Netherlands. But in most cases, they remain, you know, as in Sweden, um, uh, a substantial but still small share of the vote. And therefore, what matters is how the mainstream parties respond. What matters is how mainstream parties respond. And clearly, um, uh, there has been a temptation on both the right and on the left, um, uh, first to ignore the problem and then to appease. On the left, because uh, in many cases, the people who vote um, for populist parties are um, uh, the white working class who previously would have voted uh, for um, social democrats or their equivalent, and on the and on the right, um, because um, you know, some of the themes um, of, 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 of nationalism and social conservatism are, are extreme versions of, of, of views that are held uh, on the right. And I think that um, in in either case, um, uh, what seem what what might seem like a, a reasonable or even a, a, an intelligent strategy is a very dangerous one. Um, because for the reasons I gave. First of all, because you legitimize those views, and second of all, because um, uh, if you give an inch, well, then, all, or then the extremists are going to simply demand more. And I think Denmark is a very good example of that. Um, uh, and uh, um, so I think it's, Sweden is it's very important that in Sweden, where you're just at the beginning of this process, um, that you don't make the same mistakes that have been made elsewhere. Mm. Uh, I just visited another seminar where uh, they had made a survey and asked Swedish voters uh, which parties they would like to see represented in the government after the next election. And uh, in spite of Sweden Democrats only gaining around 7-8% in the opinion polls, on that question, if they were going to be represented in the government, 16-18% to 18 said that they would like to see that. So, <coughs> if you were the special advisor to Sweden for one day of Swedish politics, how would we react on this information? Well, I mean, I said, I think you, I, you need to distinguish um, addressing what people's underlying concerns are. Um, as I said, there are a variety of reasons why people vote um, uh, for populist parties. No, if, if genuinely the political class isn't, isn't listening to what people are saying, then you, you, you need to have a more open and a democratic debate. If the reason why people are, are, are voting for these parties is because um, uh, you know, they feel left behind by economic change, they have been out of work for a time, then you need to address those underlying economic issues. If it is simply fear of foreigners, um, then uh, you need to be very clear in saying um, that you disagree, uh, and you need to be very clear in explaining why the analysis um, uh, is false. Um, uh, but as I said, uh, you, you can see, I mean, a good example is the Netherlands. The Netherlands used to have a reputation of being a very liberal and tolerant place. And then it reached a kind of pressure built up and then reached a tipping point and then it's kind of flipped and you go to the Netherlands now and even among so-called liberal people you hear the most outrageous things said and that's, that's, that, that's the danger is that, you know, you can s suddenly the old consensus can, can shatter and you can end up in a much more nasty world. Um, and it's important um, uh, to take action before you reach that point. Thank you. I mean, Tobias and Maria, you both share a very strong view on the benefit or the, the moral idea of, of uh, having migration and uh, opening for it and uh, giving, giving possibilities for it. But if you look at the European level, uh, it doesn't seem that you have so much inspiration to, to search for from your fellow partners outside in Europe. I mean, we heard from, from Britain about uh, the conservatives there, and we saw in Switzerland that the other day that the Green Liberals supported a, a proposal about giving second class uh, rights to, to foreign citizens. So, how should, how, what do you think about that? <coughs> Um, do you have any dialogue, substantial dialogue with other colleagues in Europe trying to find 
and trying to make the European policy go in the right direction? Or are you strictly national in, in these issues? When it comes to the, the Green Party and the Green MEPs, there is a complete uh, full, full support for a more humane and more open migration policy. And I actually haven't seen the, the example in the, the Swiss uh, uh, support for something. But I think it's an exception. Uh, we just had a, a huge congress on a global scale in Senegal, uh, where we uh, met uh, Green parties from all over the world, and we ac actually adopted a resolution on migration, which was, which was very open, very uh, had a very much several proposals on how migration policy should be more open, more humane in the entire world, and it was something that all Green parties on a global scale, uh, said so was uh, the right way to go. So there is absolutely complete support. When it comes to green parties, and actually I think that's pretty interesting because I uh, I haven't seen the same uh, support, ideological support, in another political movement, movement for uh, a more open migration policy. Yes. Yeah. Well, first of all, since you mentioned the, the need to actually about facts in, in the introduction, uh, I would say that there are plenty of evidence to be brought forward if you want to, uh, showing the benefits of migration, especially in relationship to third countries, where you can see a clear link between migration and development. And if you enhance migration, you also enhance the possibilities of countries in the third world to get a better economic standing because of the money that migrants send back home. And for this, there are plenty of scientific evidence. We already know as of today that the entire value of money sent back home by migrants to their country of origin of three times the entire aid given by the industrialized world to a third world. We're speaking about an enormous amount of money. And making that money, uh, you know, or seeing to it that that money, that sum of money, is becoming enhanced in years to come by allowing a greater uh, migration, I think, is important. But we also have to understand, if we look at the European arena, that we have different experiences. Uh, and this, I think, uh, shouldn't be underestimated. And the UK has one experience with migration. Germany has another. Spain has a third. And if we look at the Eastern European countries, we can't really look away from the fact that almost none of the countries who entered in, uh, into the EU after the latest enlargement procedure uh, in 2004-2005 uh, receives uh, very many uh, asylum seekers. They simply don't. Uh, I think that Estonia last year got about 32 people. We got about this year in the prognosis between 32,000 and 35,000. That gives you some idea of how some ministers in the Council of Justice and Home Affairs view these issues. It's simply not an important matter because it's not in their everyday, uh, everyday uh, agenda. <coughs> Unlike some other ministers, like myself. <laughs> and, yet, and yet, the Stockholm program holds. The document that was adopted in 2009 under the Swedish presidency, which spe speaks uh, a good deal about migration, in, in fact, is still holding on. And since we follow this working program, uh, suggestions, proposals, directives ticks out from the Commission in accordance with the program. And while the Stockholm program stresses uh, border control and security issues, that's natural because it was a good deal of it. Also wish of a good deal of the, of the member states. It also speaks about the need for increased migration. And it speaks for tools for, for cooperation with countries outside of the EU. So I think I'm not, look, I'm not looking too dark on the situation. But I do agree completely that appeasement is not a way forward. It has never been. You can't appease people who don't want to see increased migration. You can't appease people who are at all down and a very dark picture of the, the uh, results of migration. Regardless of whether it's asylum seekers or labor migrants, I should underline. Yeah. We have an election coming up in two years, and uh, since this uh, reform on labor force, immigration was a uh, result of the alliance parties working together with the Green Party, if there will be a majority change, do you see any risk for this reform to be, be 
no changed? Or? It depends on how the new majority would what it would look like. Mm -hmm. Because after all, if it would look like something which which it is right now, uh, but with the inclusion of more and uh, more parties and so on, I don't perceive any, any great danger. But uh, if there were to be a complete shift, of course, and if the Social Democratic Party were to form a new majority, uh, I'm quite sure that there would be substantial changes. Mm -hmm. uh, because the Social Democracy have tried quite clearly signaled that they don't like the labor migration reform from 2008. They don't like the elements of, of uh, uh, openness towards the employer being able to pick and choose. So I think I'm much very frank that here is a, 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 a division line in Swedish politics. The same goes for the, for the, the uh, left party as well. Um, however, I also think that we should look at the alternative. We speak a lot about changes and so on. Um, if we look at the Sweden Democrats, I think that the most uh, astonishing uh, factor after all is that in spite of the fact that we have had the, sever the severest economic crisis for 100 years, which has also hit Sweden hard, uh, the Sweden Democrats still only have, well, between 595 7%. The, the, the largest sum that I've seen is between 7 and 8%. That's not very much, especially not on a European comparison. And I, I wonder why. <laughs> well, I think it has a good deal to do with what Maria brought up, namely that the debate, the tone of the debate in Sweden, is different from the rest of the European Union, where you always look at migrants as the problem. You don't speak about the need to reform your integration policy <coughs> in a way that you actually bring more people into the labor market quicker, and you speak about if you only remove the migratory component uh, of the politics, then everything will be all right. And I think that that produces, in turn, a, a different uh, rhetoric, a different tone of, tone of voice in the debate. With the Netherlands as being the most frightening example, because it took less than a year for the Netherlands to turn from being, as you said, quite clearly, a very open-minded and, and a very liberal country, to something which is very much different, uh, I'm afraid. I was wondering about your book. It has been published in different languages. Is there anything in the receiving of the book that, that has surprised you? What has been the, the comments and was it something there that you were, you were not you know, expecting? Well, I mean, obviously I've learned a lot um, uh, by going around the world to speak about migration and about the differences um, in uh, debates. And, and I agree with, with uh, Tobias that um, the debate here in Sweden is um, uh, more positive uh, and more liberal um, uh, than, than nearly anywhere else. Uh, and I also applaud uh, the reforms that, 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 that he's made. Um, uh, at, the, at the same time uh, that you see that um, uh, despite these uh, uh, differences, that actually uh, migration is a global debate, um, uh, and that though the concerns might be expressed in different ways, um, that actually um, uh, it's about an open society versus closed society, uh, it's about whether you're comfortable um, with uh, people who you perceive as different um, or not. Um, uh, it's whether um, uh, you uh, see change as an opportunity or as a threat. And those are kind of the underlying uh, issues um, expressed in different ways uh, everywhere. Um, we can't have a seminar in Almadon without inviting the audience to, to place questions. So please go ahead and uh, you can also introduce yourself before placing a question. Thank you. Uh, Michael Williams, the Church of Sweden. I'd like to ask the Minister, when you said that you had 50,000 applications uh, within the labour market statistics, I believe, uh, does that include uh, EES uh, citizens? Or you know, what is the total labour migration? Because we have different groups of third country nationals and we, yes, so when you said 50,000, I was a bit confused. What were you exactly referring to? And then a second issue, which has also been raised uh, here, is um, what is the position of human rights in the field of migration? Do we only accord rights to those who have citizenship, or do we interpret the conventions as intended? These are your rights in as much as you are a human being. Because within labor migration, there are many differences between many countries on the right to family reunification, uh, 
uh, qualification periods, uh, etc. And those issues can also be a bone of contention, even if you have, let's say, the flows and the openness. And we are seeing some of those discussions even in Sweden, and even between the government and the Green Party, there are outstanding issues after this very positive agreement, which do refer partly to that, I know it's a dilemma, but uh, it's definitely a part of the migration debate. Thank you. Please. 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 Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for the question. To begin with, uh, no, we are speaking about 50,000 because that is under this reform. Then we're taking the additional ES, uh, 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 the, uh, the additional citizens of the EES countries. Uh, want to. But under the rules of this reform, and I think we should separate it, we're talking about between 45 to 50,000. As for the issue of human rights in relationship to migration, this is, as I know that Mr. Williams are very well aware of, a complicated matter. Because while we all, of course, uh, believe in human rights and believe that human rights are rights which uh, uh, every single human being, being uh, are encompassed by, we also have <coughs> to of those rights pertaining to having a residence permit or a citizenship to a state. Now, we can all debate to and fro, and fro how much we believe in the nation states, but they are there on the table. They are what we have to work with, and they exist. And the states also believe, whether they are part of the European Union or not, that they have a right to decide who is going to decide upon the territory. From this follows that they also believe that they have a right to decide what sort of rights that, that people should have. And, of course, we can always speak about, let's say, the right to labor, the right to work on, on, on the labor market. Is that a human right? Some people who believe in a more than large catalog, often when you, when you uh, uh, talk about rights within the UN Charter of Human Rights, that it should be included. Some stops uh, at the more early stage and say that the right to life, the right to, to freedom of speech, and so on and so forth are human rights. Now this we could have a very lengthy debate about, I'm sure. We could probably have about three seminars in Amadala and probably not reach a complete conclusion of what we believe in. For my part, I think that it's always a matter of trying to find a balance. Balance between what is best for the individual and what is best for the uh, people who are already citizens in the, the particular country. And this has to be looked upon very often from an individual point of view. If you look at the, the opportunity which we built into the labor migration reform for making what we call a track change, for an asylum seeker who has had uh, a, 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 um, a negative response to their asylum question, but who has lived here for a longer period of time. We now allow people to make that track change. Within a specific, specified time, you can hand in your application, you have to show that you have had a job within the white sector, that you have been given an honest salary, and so on and so forth, and it's always an individual assessment. But you do have a right to make such a track change. Now, this was something which I was a bit, I should say, skeptic to from the beginning. But I was convinced then, in the negotiations with the Green Party, that this, this was actually going to turn out quite well. And I have to say that it has. It allows us to avoid situations where people have actually stayed, rooted themselves because of the lengthy asylum procedure, to, to make this track change. There will always be negative responses within this system of track change as well, but it's, again, a question of balance. So, a lengthy answer, but it's a complicated answer. Thank you. Want to comment? Uh, well, of course we have a slightly different uh, point of view uh, when it comes to human rights and what should be included. And, and uh, it's uh, therefore very interesting to have uh, continuing discussions uh, with the government on these issues. And the reforms that we have uh, decided upon in the framework agreement are very positive and goes in the direction of uh, including more human rights, like the right to uh, to, to subsidized health care for our documented immigrants, like we presented a few days ago. And as you said, we have uh, a few reforms left to uh, to present. Uh, it's going to be interesting to, to work on those as well. And they are going in the direction that you are okay. 
Thank you, uh, Ben de Lim, Tom, and Vice Chair and Liberal, liberal Students. Um, I would like to hear you elaborate a bit more about the debate on the European level. Philip sketched quite well the national debates in many European countries when it comes to immigration policies, but don't you think that you are underestimating a bit how this debate might move up on the European level in the European Union on, in the ongoing harmonization in the Stockholm program? Um, I would like to hear you elaborate a little bit more on that. Thank you very much for the question. Well, I've been a serving member now of the Justice and Home Affairs Council for six years since I took office in 2006. That makes me the, the longest standing member of the Justice and Home Affairs Council. I'm in fact the oldest minister, <laughs> <laughs> which I recognize from a lot that you might find a bit, a bit uh, how should I say, strange. Uh, but it's a, it's a fact. And that has, of course, happened because. Uh, all the changes that have taken place, elections, etc., etc. However, I've seen a lot of ministers coming and going during these six years, and I've also heard a lot of arguments. Mm. While there might be different approaches, as I said before, to the questions of asylum, labor migration, family reunification, etc., etc., I haven't heard anyone since we adopted the Stockholm program who actually proposes the program. And it is the program which is the working program of the EU. It's that program which gives the instructions and the strategy which the Commission is then bound to follow. When the Commission, I'm pointing to Philippe here as a sort of you know, <laughs> intra alia representative of the Commission. Mm -hmm. But in, anyway, this is, this is important uh, because if there had been a true questioning of the social <coughs> program as such, then I would have been very worried. Because that would have been, you know, think, unthinkable to break off, you know, a, a, a decided program because of, of the complexity of these matters. Um, and finally, uh, well, among ministers also there are different approaches. Uh, all uh, governments in the European Union have ministries of finance, and they can count. That's what they are there for, <laughs> and they know fully well the uh, elements of of the the uh, uh, things which Philippe began to talk about. In Introduction speech, namely the demographic challenge. They know what it would mean for Germany when they find themselves in lack of hundreds and thousands of people in the years to come, as we would do, and other countries as well. What it would mean for social insurance systems, for taxes, for you know even operating societies when you don't have enough hands to do the job. And I think that we should take this into account when we talk about this. It's one thing what you say publicly when you're confronted with cameras and journalists, and it's a different matter altogether when you're sitting at your desk trying to work out a working policy for the years to come. And I think that you will find in the years to come that a lot of uh, uh, member states are operating a dual policy at the moment. They are trying to find what shall we do and find out what shall we do. This goes for all countries, I should say, because there is no country in the European Union at the moment who are not affected by the demographic challenge. And some countries, like Poland, will feel this very, very rapidly. They have a demo demography which looks something like this. You know, when you, you look at it, the ratio of people who are elderly and the ratio of nativity. What do you do when the gap becomes, you know, insubstantial? I think it's the correct term. What do you do then, as a minister, it would be very, very tough to try and be a politician in some of these countries, including Sweden, when we approach the year 2050, and we are at a situation where we have approximately, today we have um, about four people who work for every retired person. 2050, we would have two persons who work for every retired person. Being minister for social insurance, or being Minister for Finance, it's not going to be so easy in the years around 2050, I can tell you. Thank you. Listening to you, I mean, this, these are perspectives that very seldom are discussed in the Swedish debate. They become very national. Even though, if we look at the demographic uh, challenge, you can see that of all migrants coming to the European member state last year, I mean, they have been younger, and so, so they have, uh, they're obviously uh, a kind of answer to the demographic challenge if you want to see it in the broader perspective. Yeah, partly, yes, but then, then, then we also have to think about our own possibility, our, I should say, our own pictures when it comes to, to be able to compete with others. What will happen when the BRICS country, Brazil, Russia, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, becomes more hotter 
in the global economy. And they start saying, well, hello, we can offer better salaries, better retirement plans, better opportunities, and a warmer climate. <laughs> Which we can't do anything about. I know it's very difficult to, you know, to sort of, you know, bring forth that argument today here in this view, in this beautiful summit uh, uh, situation. But it, is, it, it, it will become very difficult. And our situation in, in the European Union, for some of the countries like Sweden, Denmark, Norway, very small countries, not very high knowledge about them in the global arena, I'm trying to pursue people to choose our countries over other available alternatives. We call for a lot of effort by ourselves to be able to do this. A lot of effort. And perhaps in some cases it will be impossible because other countries will be much higher on the ranking list. I would like to ask you, Philippe, about policy making on the European level. I mean, there, there are discussion, ongoing discussions about harmonizing certain aspects of, of rights, as you were talking about, but <coughs> there the country's differences may, make it difficult because if you establish one standard, they will create problems in a certain country claiming that this is not even the right to give to our own citizens, so we can't do that. What do you think? Should we strive for harmonization or should we just try to find compatible states trying to offer as best offers as they can? And, uh, also due to the fact that we are in a race. What sure. Well, first of all, let me say, I mean, I'm speaking in a personal capacity. Um, generally, I'm Pro-European, I think cooperating at a European level is, is generally a good thing. I'm skeptical how far you can go in migration policy for the reason you said, which is there is huge divergence of opinions uh, and of national circumstances. And insofar as agreement is possible, it would most likely be on a very <coughs> common denominator and quite anti-migration basis. And I don't think that would be desirable for Europe, and it certainly wouldn't be desirable for Sweden um, if it was um, uh, forced to uh, conform to a less liberal uh, European norm. Um, so, I, I, uh, in that case, um, uh, I think what we have now, with common elements, you know, for example, we can certainly have a, a more rational European um, uh, asylum policy. I think, um, uh, I, I think uh, that's the way forward. I didn't get a chance to answer the issue on, on human rights. I mean, I think for me, um, if you look at, first of all, if you look at the um, International Declaration on Human, Universal Declaration on Human Rights, you see uh, that people have a right to leave a country. Um, but states do not have a, a, an obligation to accept them. Right? They don't have a right to, to enter another country, which is a kind of strange kind of right. You can you, you can leave a country, but you can't, you, you can't go anywhere else. Um, and um, uh, it, I think that actually um, uh, the system we have now, I, I agree with Tobias, we're built on it's built on nation states, but at the same time is is deeply illiberal. Um, it's one of the most fundamental rights to be able to uh, to, to move somewhere else. Um, uh, and uh, and the system we're moving towards now, which is is, is a kind of system of, of, of global apartheid, where certain people have a right to move freely, and other people are expected to stay put. Or you could characterize it a different way. It's a bit like feudalism. You know, that if you're if you're highly skilled, you're like the you like the lord, and you can travel around wherever you want. And if you're if you're low skilled, then you're tied to the land like the serfs used to be. And you can see practical arguments for why this might be. Um, uh, why, th why this might be um, a good thing, but I think from a moral point of view, I think it's deeply, deeply questionable. Thank you. Uh, we are going to wrap up this seminar, but I would like to uh, ask you a final question, a personal one. Why are you here? Why are you involved in these issues? Why do you work with them? And we'll start off with two minutes. Well, for my part, I've, I've, I've been active in, in migration courses now for many, many years. Uh, even before I became a minister, I was a member of parliament for, for uh, the city of Malmo, and before that I was a municipality politician in Malmo for 12 years before entering parliament. Uh, so I have seen a lot of issues relating to migration, uh, and, and for me this is very, very important. I've also been a migrant myself uh, when I was a student at, at the Cambridge University in the UK for one year. Uh, that taught me a lot, I can tell you, uh, about what it means to reside in a country which you, after all, think that you would know how to work around, uh, how to get around in, and, and you're faced with a situation where you know, your language skills are, well, not as good as you would like them to be, and uh, your knowledge of how the healthcare system works are, you know, very much lower than you would, would like it to be, and so on and so forth. 
I continue to be active in migration because I think that there are no other subjects, uh, apart from perhaps environmental issues, which are also very uh, closely connected to migration issues, which is more important. Migration and mobility forms such an enormous part of the world economy and, and our own economy in Sweden today. We don't often think of that, uh, maybe because of the fact that Philip mentioned. I mean, how many in here has ever been refused a visa application to another country? Or well, maybe Zimbabwe, North Korea, and Cuba mm. could be on the list. Maybe one or two of you have had that. But very few Swedish citizens have ever been refused a, a, a visa application to another country. And yet, hundreds and thousands of people outside of, of our small territory are would would experience of this. So enhancing mobility, creating better ways for people to come in a legal way to our union and to Sweden, I think is a, something worth working for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, mm -hmm. uh, which sometimes is what you do as a minister, as, at least it feels that way. <laughs> uh, so. Thank you, Maria. Well, um, I have a similar story. Um, of course, I also think it's one of the most important issues of our time and uh, I think that uh, Philip said something about the main question now is uh, an open versus a closed society uh, when it comes to globalization and, and, and so on and I also believe that uh, if the uh, the last century, if the big issues concerned for the last century were uh, uh, the uh, the clash between left and right, I think that the for the next 100 years uh, the debate will uh, have to do with it, it will be nationalists versus people who strive for a noble society. I think that that's where the political uh, debate will, I mean, that's going to be the biggest questions. Are we going to move towards a society which will be uh, close, more, more and more closed, or will we go in the next direction, or the, in the other direction? I think that's the most important questions for the next 100 years, and we'll decide lots, a lot about how our country and how the rest of the world will develop, develop which way we'll well, um, I wrote a first book on um, globalization, um, and that led me to start thinking about migration. Um, and at the time, people kind of categorized it different, you know, kind of like trade and investment is globalization, migration is sometimes somehow different. And then you start to think about it and actually see they're all part of aspects of, the, of, of integration and they're all aspects um, of openness. So that's what got me thinking about it. Um, and then partly because of my personal background, my father is French, my mother is Estonian, I grew up in uh, London, so I've always had an aware of kind of the different, awareness of difference and, 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 and migration. Um, and partly because um, I was angry, confused by the tone the, uh, of, the, of the debate, which was so negative. I had a look on Amazon, and I was astonished that there were no, there were lots of things saying, you know, the death of Britain and you know, alien nation and all this, but there were no actually pro-migration books. I aimed at a wider audience, uh, so it was also an opportunity. Um, and then the more that I got involved in debate, I mean, one more fascinated I've become because you know, immigration and mobility touches on every aspect of, of human life. It, it, it helps you understand the underlying values um, of society. Um, and partly because for me it's become a moral campaign because uh, as you become aware of it, you, you realize how much of what passes for being sort of normal common sense is actually um, deeply, um, deeply wrong. Um, uh, it's deeply wrong economically, it's deeply wrong politically, and it's deeply wrong uh, morally. Uh, and uh, I agree with you. I think that the, the battle between open and closed is, is the battle of the 21st century, and a large aspect of it is, 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 is uh, linked to mobility. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Philip, we are also going to have another discussion now whether we can make this wonderful book uh, available for Swedish audience. We will come back on that later. Uh, thank you very much for <coughs> sharing with us. Uh, both of the wonderful questions, but especially to you, of course, uh, this debate. I don't know, maybe the next hundred years, but we will surely be involved in uh, 
uh, all of us who, who are here and also for us, of course. I would also like to point out Kai Silano, who is there. She is our coordinator of the migration program on migration of course. And we will be happy to receive all ideas and thoughts about how to develop that program. So welcome back to Forest, both here in Amadolin and also back in Stockholm. Thank you for coming. Oh,